E o quero te cantar porque eu estou interessado em escutar. When I was 17 years old, I started to suffer from a pain in my throat. Psychiatrists call it globus hystericus, completely psychosomatic. Eventually, I developed depressions uh, and even considered suicide, and I could not relax. At the age of 25, when I tried yoga, I felt as if somebody is putting a nail into my throat here and it's coming out from the other side. So I learned to cope with the pain by working many hours and ignoring what's going on inside. So I couldn't feel anything from here down. And in this way, I was able to uh, raise a family, succeed in my career, and things were as if they were okay until by the age of 46, I was hit by a crisis that was sparked by a consultant using questions from appreciative inquiry, she asked. When were the relationships between men and women ideal? And could you please tell a story about a moment at work in which you felt full of life? I was stunned. First, I realized how much little joy I had in my life. And second, I realized that answering this question is changing me thanks to somebody listening to me. So uh, then I allowed myself to try a variety of things such as massage therapy, psychodrama, uh, storytelling classes, voice classes, um, Zen Buddhism workshops, and more recently, dialectical behavioral therapy, and things start to change for me. First, I could feel the pain again, but I didn't run away from it. Eventually, I even start to feel anxiety, which I didn't know what it was until that age. But more later, I uh, won some moments of tranquility, quietness, and moments of joy. And I started to ask myself, what made it possible? And my answer was that I was so lucky as to raise myself a village of people who would listen to me. So then I uh, decided to research listening, and today I would like to, search, to share with you the results of this research. So I first looked in the professional literature in my field of management and organizational behavior, and in one top uh, journal out of 3,000 papers, I found zero discussing listening. Another top journal out of 4,000 papers, two discussed listening. And while it reflects something about the disinterest of researchers in listening, I think it only reflects the disinterest of humans in listening. Watch with me this graph. This shows what people are searching in Google. Um, from 2004 until 2015. The red is the amount of searches for the word talking, and the blue is for listening. This is what people are interested in. And you speaking Portuguese do not have to worry about falar in red uh, versus escutar in blue. So um, I started to look at what theories exist out there about listening, and I'll share with you three, and starting with the idea that actually the listener dictates the quality of the speech of the speaker. That is, if I'm going to listen to you, naturally you'll talk more, but you'll talk more coherently, and you'll t tell more interesting stories. And if this is not enough, if you tell more and more interesting stories, you commit whatever you have said to your memory. So you know more about yourself, such that if a child comes home and tells the parents, oh, we this, did this and that in school, and the parents said, not now, go have a shower, and we have to have dinner, the child will remember that whatever he or she did in school was not that interesting. That what will be committed to memories. Thus, the collection of our listeners slowly, imperceptibly, 
change our self-knowledge. And if this is not enough, listening in a special way could even change personality. A listening that is non-judgmental and em emphatic. Let me explain to you how could it be that listening will change personality. For that, I have to paraphrase Pirandello from his book Uno Nessuno e Cento Mil, or One, No One and One Hundred Thousand. From now, I'm going to act, so don't get scared. I see that you are laughing at me. That's fine. Continue to laugh at me. But do me a favor. Do you remember the case that you had that in your home, there was a good friend sitting with you, and suddenly, a new friend was knocking on the door, and you, what did you do? With an ugly excuse, you asked the new, the old friend to go home because you were afraid that the old friend and the new friend will not get along. So I see that you remember this case. So do me one more little favor. What do you think would have had happened if instead of throwing out from your home the good old friend, and let me add, the stunned good old friend, you would have left your home for half an hour? And within this half an hour, ask the new friend and the old friend to sit in your living room. Now tell me, what do you think would have had happened when you came back home? Don't you think it's possible that one of them would say, wow, what an interesting person. And the, the other one, you don't believe it. Thank you for this introduction. So you see that this is exactly what would have had, had happened. So now let me ask you one more question. Who the hell do you think you kicked out from your home? It is not the good old friend because he or she will not get along with the new friend. We just established they would have gotten along just fine. Let me tell you, you kicked out from your home the character that you present to the old friend because this character has absolutely nothing to do with the character that you wanted now to present to your new friend. And now that we discover that you have two creatures in your mind, who knows what is the truth? How many creatures you have inside? Is it scores, hundreds, or perhaps more accurately, thousands? So I'm saying to Pirandello two things. First, chapeau. 70 years before the psychologist, you describe the self as a multitude and not as a unity. We say my self-esteem as if there is one self there. But the second thing, Mr. Pirandello, what wrong did to you the people attending TEDx? That then and now will go home and will think I have this character and this character and they'll get crazy like the hero of your book. And here comes listening. My understanding is that when you really listen, a person will start to hear hidden characters inside him or her. And but not only he recognize different parts of the self, but it allows to build bridges between them so the elements of the self could live together. So let's see what is the evidence. Now to collect the evidence, you know, some people uh, collect stamps. I collect scientific papers on listening. And every paper that has numerical data, I take it and I put it in a bin to see the overall picture of what do we know. And this process is called meta-analysis. I've done many of those on many topics, and let me first summarize to you the results. This is the results. One person listening creates two people with benefits, the listener and the speaker. Let's go into the details. For example, experiments really show that poor listeners indeed create poor speakers. My own team showed that good listener indeed makes speakers who have more complex attitudes and less extreme. And finally, research on training suggests that listening could be taught. Let's see more data. There is also uh, evidence that good listeners are also good performers. For example, physicians who listen well tend to have less malpractice lawsuits. Detectives who listen well uh, tend to find 
to elicit new information unknown to the police from the suspect. Salespeople who listen well sell more. Principals who listen to their teachers, their students have better grades in the school. And finally, supervisors who listen, their employees have less accidents. Let me show you even more. Let me explain this graph of meta-analysis. Uh, on the first line, you see that I found in this collection 13 studies uh, that are accumulating information over almost 8,000 people, and it suggests that if you listen to other people, especially if you're the boss, they will think that you're a leader of people, that you know how to lead the people aspect in leadership. You will feel more psychological safety, you will say what's in your mind, you will trust the listener, if it's your boss, you'll have higher job satisfaction. If you're a physician, your patient will be more satisfied. If you're a boss, uh, your workers will have more commitment. If you work in a hospital and you listen to your patient, there will be less violence against the staff. If your uh, manager listens to you, you'll have less burnout, your performance is higher, and maybe a little bit uh, even less depression. And let me tell you, that everything to the right of the line here uh, is considered a strong association in my field. Let me explain what I mean by strong association. Let's take the case of job satisfaction as an example. If I want to predict, to forecast your job satisfaction, and I know how much you are being paid relative to other people, I can slightly predict your job satisfaction. But if I know whether your boss listens to you or not, I have a predictor that is 13 and a half stronger and more accurate than your pay. Next, in my research in past years, I was studying the destructive effect of feedback on performance. And I found out that they, out of 607 experiments, in close to 40% of them, after feedback, whether positive or negative, performance goes down. 38%. In contrast, in listening, I didn't find any evidence that listening can cause damage. Perhaps 5% of them showed it, it doesn't produce anything effective. So my most, most conservative estimate is that giving feedback is seven and a half times more dangerous than just listening. The talking could cause you trouble. So if listening is so useful, why is it that most of us have difficulty in listening most of the time? I want to uh, introduce to you the enemies of listening. These are boredom, dominance, fear of intimacy, trauma, and cost. Let's talk about each of them alone. Uh, and my approach is let's collaborate with the enemies of listening rather than fight them. The first enemy is boredom. Some people may talk your ear off and you said, I can't listen to this anymore. You want to leave the room or you want them to leave the room. What can you do? You can ask them to tell stories. Instead of asking, what's your name? Could you tell me something interesting about your name? And you can ask these people and in general, after they said whatever they say, and what else? And wait. Sometimes the boring person will start to tell the truth of what's really important. It's not going to be boring anymore. Next, all of us want to gain social status. It's perhaps an evolutionary force that we cannot fight. But we can do it in two different ways. We can dominate other people by intimidating them and instilling fear in them. Or we can have some skill that people want to imitate or to get from us and we build prestige. And we found that if you listen, you're going to lose social status based on dominance. But you will gain social status based on prestige. So it's up to you to choose how do you want to build your status. And then some people, when you try to listen to them, they get nervous. They, you ask them questions, they are not comfortable. For those type of people, try to talk to them at first only about technical things. And then, when you help, uh, when you listen to people, you may start to hear horrible stories about the Holocaust, about rape, 
uh, about cancer, death, premature death, and you may feel burdened that you now need to help the person who shared this story, but you should know that oftentimes what the other person wants is nothing but you listen. So if you listen and you believe in it that it's helpful, you will not have such a burden. And last, listening is a cost. It's an effort. So thus I suggest you spread your eggs and don't start right now to listen to everyone. It's impossible. Every day, choose one, two people to listen just a little bit more. And then uh, you should respect your limitation of how much you really can listen. And to build your energy to do that, you will need somebody to listen to you as well. So, um, actually, everything that I've said is not that new. Let me show you what's written in the book of Proverbs in the Bible. Counsel in the heart of men is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. That is, each of us have an advice, a counsel to our own problems and challenges. And the value of this uh, advice is like water, which is a source of life. That is, the advice that we have for ourselves is a source of life. But a man or a person of understanding will draw it out. This is the other that will bring our own wisdom outside. So I'd like to conclude with two dreams that I have. One, I wish that in 20 or 30 years from now, every child in every school will learn reading and writing and listening. And my other small wish is that during the break, the breaks here today and tomorrow, you will go and ask somebody around you, could you tell me a story about good listening? Enjoy. <laughs>